Welcome everyone. Living with chronic pain can be harder to handle than words can describe. Not only do chronic pain warriors have to live with the physical pain, but equally so with the emotional pain of a life full of anxiety, frustration, fear, and uncertainty. And for the caregiver who must also adapt to the emotions and sudden change that come with supporting a loved one who lives with persistent pain. Both perspectives can be challenging and life altering. Is it any wonder why communication and relationships are often strained in the presence of chronic pain? We know that a strong support system from loved ones helps to reduce pain, anxiety, and depression. So how can we improve communication and strained relationships when living under the shadow of persistent pain? Well, that is exactly what we will be discussing in this episode of the not so 15 minute chronic pain experience podcast. So let's dive in. I am very, very excited to introduce you to my guest today, Rachel Hunter. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. This is fantastic. I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit about you before we dive in uh, and the reason why I was so excited to have it on here. Uh, So Rachel is a mental health therapist, certified wellness and relationship coach and owner of RDH Counseling and Consulting, LLC. She has worked with countless women who struggle with loving and connecting with themselves, recognizing their value and worth and connecting with others, especially in their romantic relationships. She has over 15 years experience as a public speaker, consultant and trainer and enjoys providing her expertise and knowledge to individuals, groups and businesses like our small little community here. Uh, Rachel is passionate about helping individuals heal from their past trauma and wounding and becoming their healthiest selves. Rachel is the creator of Self-Care, Becoming Your Own Best Friend, online course that helps women learn how to engage in authentic self-care practices to enrich and enhance the quality of their lives. Her most recent course focuses on helping women heal from relationships trauma and learn to release fear and experience intimacy with their partner. Need I say more? I cannot be more excited to have you on because one of the huge issues we have in our chronic pain community is a lot tied into the whole relationship experience and the communication that happens within it. I mean, communication, as you, you know, all too well, is really complicated on its own, throw in chronic pain to the mix and things get a little more touchy, right? Yes. So uh, again, thank you so much for being here. Let's talk about uh, the potential strain on a marriage that chronic pain often presents. Yeah, there is a marriage in and of itself. Mm -hmm. even outside of pain um, is a challenge because you're bringing two worlds together and asking them to align, to connect and, and, and to adjust. Right. And then when you throw pain into that mixture, it really can create issues and problems. So when you're looking at it from the perspective of the pain warrior, the individual that is experiencing the pain, their life it's turned upside down, right? And depending on how long they've experienced the pain, it really changes them, right? So think about it from this perspective, you are living with an unwanted companion. Right, well said. Yeah, and so you're trying to manage and deal with that relationship. Mm -hmm. And then you're expected to engage with your partner. Mm -hmm. And if, Let's say if this was, um, you didn't have it your, your whole life and this is something that's newly happening, mm-hmm. um, it's an adjustment for you. Mm-hmm. And so it is certainly very challenging to be able to one, explain or communicate what you have going on. Um, and so when you're not able to communicate your needs, what you're going through, it's hard for your partner to know how they can be of assistance to you. So that's going to create strain as well. Um, and then when you're looking at it from the perspective of the partner, mm-hmm. they're like, what the heck is going on? How do I handle this? How do I um, be the support for my loved one? And so if there's this, this feeling or the sense of insecurity or helplessness, man, that's going to play a big role as well, because it's like, okay, what's my role? What do I do in this situation? Um, and then it, the pain challenges the whole dynamic of the relationship, because if there's pain or illness, 
well, then now we've got to go to the doctors, right? Now our life, the way we pictured it being is challenged, it's changed, it's disrupted and life happens. And if we don't have healthy coping, um, we don't know what to do or we don't respond mm-hmm. in health ways. So all of that is uh, additional stress and it, it really does create additional strain in a marriage. Right. And I love how you said it's like that extra person in the relationship that yes. uh, chronic pain experience. Absolutely. And I, and, and you touched on beautifully the whole grief experience. I mean, life is not the same as it was, or perhaps what they expected. And so thank you so much for hitting on that. I think that wraps up the podcast. You wrapped it up beautifully all in one question. I'm kidding. We have so much to talk about, but you just stated that eloquently. I think um, for those, for our listeners, um, you know, I should also state that you are coming from a place of experience. You know what you're talking about, not only professionally, but personally, you have lived with endometriosis and amazingly it's been resolved. So kudos to you. I, um, I know that uh, it always resonates that much more when someone has been there. <laughs> right. Okay. So getting back to where we were, um, I'm sure there are likely some good examples too of where couples, I don't hear it as often, unfortunately, but when couples maybe even come together a little bit more. So once that third person, the chronic pain has been introduced into their lives, um, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping that that in some instances may bring their bond a little closer together. And those are the people I will be talking to next to, to really see what kind of communication skills they've used. I recently did a podcast with, um, uh, Danielle Jardine and she went through a horrific uh, car accident and she's a great example of, um, the partnership and how the husband is really pushing her and encouraging her in such a loving way. So I just wanted to mention that it can go both ways. Obviously, uh, more of the issue that we're talking about today is when that communication is not aligning. Part of the reason I was really excited to have you on board today is I know that you work with um, women, especially who are working through trauma. And I know that in the chronic pain community, uh, unresolved trauma is a huge indicator of pain and the pain experience and and to what level of, of pain they feel. So how does the presence of past or present or unresolved trauma really sort of show itself in communication specifically? Yeah, or lack that of. is, yeah, that is a really good question. And I always like to help my clients understand the connection because mm-hmm. there is a connection between trauma, mm-hmm. the way we respond to it, mm-hmm. um, and the way our body is responding to it. So if there is trauma, right, if something has happened and it is created, um, there's an emotional wounding that's taking place and it hasn't been resolved. There's no healing, there's no resolution that has happened, then it really is going to impact um, our bodies, um, our bodies. So when we think about, um, think about being angry, right? When we get angry, so think about the last time that you were angry, what did you feel like? What did your, how did your body respond to that anger? Did your mm-hmm. face get flushed? Did your heart beat fast? And what that shows us is there is a direct connection between the mind and the body, right? So the psychosomatic um, response, that's what that is. How you're feeling um, emotionally, mentally, what you're going through, it, the way the body is created, God really designed our bodies to be connected. So how you feel, your body is going to tell the story. Right. And so if we're dealing with unresolved trauma and wounding, that certainly can come out in your body in, in the form of pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can come out in the form of different diseases, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so when we are traumatized mm-hmm. and if pain is a response to that trauma, it really comes out and it, and, and it shows up in how we show up, right? So when we're talking about being able to communicate mm-hmm. what I'm going through, my experience uh, and what my needs are, it may not be very easy for me to do. Mm-hmm. So when things happen to us, um, there is something called our core beliefs. Mm-hmm. So our core beliefs are um, the way we, what we believe about ourselves, others in the world. 
Right. So when trauma occurs to us, when people have mistreated us, uh, when we've been in situations where we felt powerless, we felt weak, people have taken advantage of us, mm -hmm. uh, that shapes what we believe about ourselves, mm -hmm. our abilities, our capabilities, and our value and worth, right? So if I'm in a, in a um, relationship and I've been taught or trained that I'm not valuable, Mm -hmm. that what I feel doesn't matter. Because if I was traumatized and I shared with somebody before how I felt and they shut me down or rejected me, well, then I begin to believe that my words don't matter. I don't matter. Right. Fast forward to now I'm married mm -hmm. and I'm in pain. Mm -hmm. And I want to share that. But in the past, because I shared my pain before I was told you're lying or stop being such a crybaby or whatever. Right. I haven't learned that I matter. I haven't learned how to communicate my need right. or I'm afraid. I am believing mm -hmm. um, that it is not safe to share. Right. So all of that is going on. Yeah. Ooh, child, it's going to yeah. be very hard <laughs> for me to communicate what I'm right. experiencing to my partner. Right. And that's so, such that's so such many layers, isn't it? Of, of, and even if it wasn't something in the child, uh, the inner child, what they've experienced in the past is often in relationships, there's just that, that sense of not believing what their partners are saying. Yeah. And you're right. Just like you said, you hear that enough times. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one of the words you really uh, hit on was the capabilities part. And I think it's so challenging for a chronic pain community to really feel like they are capable of a recovery, uh, B, movement, uh, C, healing, D, you know, the list goes on and on. So uh, you're absolutely right. And you also touched on earlier just about the coping mechanisms. And if we don't, and we don't often learn those coping mechanisms, but let's talk a little bit about some of the, um, the unhealthy coping mechanisms that uh, might prevent, you know, yeah, not just a communication piece, but just a strong bond in general. Yeah. yeah. So definitely. I mean, this is something that, that is certainly needed to be discussed, right? Um, when we, so coping mechanisms, coping skills mm -hmm. are very useful mm -hmm. if we can and um, employ them, especially when we're in pain and we are trying to adjust in the relationship. Right. And so a part of uh, one of the biggest types of coping, healthy coping is self-care. And that's what I really hone in on. And, and, and I'm very passionate about teaching um, my clients, both them and their, their spouse is about self-care. That is one of the biggest uh, healthy coping mechanisms that we can use. And so when we're talking about authentic self-care, it um, encompasses a lot. One of which is um, connecting with you, mm -hmm. being mindful of what you are experiencing, mm -hmm. giving yourself permission mm -hmm. to share with someone else, giving yourself permission to um, advocate for your needs, right? Like I'm in pain right now. Mm -hmm. I would really love if, and you fill in the blank, right? Mm -hmm. So giving yourself um, permission to advocate, um, getting to a place where you feel um, confident enough to do that. Like there's no guilt connected with saying to your partner, hey, today I am not there. I, I, I'm in so much pain right now. I cannot get up and go downstairs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, of the, the pain warriors that I work with, there is this sense of, um, I have to push through to right. take care of everybody else. Yes. And yes. that adds even more mm -hmm. guilt, stress, frustration, bitterness, and resentment because mm -hmm. you're mad that you're doing it, but you're doing it because you feel guilty if you don't. Exactly. And so, yeah, self-care is really um, important. And then for the caregivers, yes. it's important for them to right. be able to take breaks and, and recognize when they're at their wits end and, and need to separate and need to have additional supports in right. place. So that self-care, if you're able to engage in it, it helps you to be in a healthier place so that you can communicate uh, with your partner and both of y'all can 
hear each other's needs and support the way that's useful. Oh, so well said. Honestly, the whole principle, I know you and I understand this concept and I, I keep reiterating this message that all pain, all chronic pain, illness is biopsychosocial in nature, right? Where it's the biological piece, it's the psychological piece and the social piece. And what you're speaking to beautifully represents both the psychological and the social side, right? Are you getting that support at home? Are you getting that? Do you feel you're getting that support medically as well? It brings me to my next point. Uh, I'm just kind of jumping a little bit ahead here, but when we're talking about communication and it's such a combination of both active listening and genuine, authentic speaking. And like you've sort of touched on before, that can be really difficult for both parties to be authentic, to yeah. be genuine, to be listening yeah. um, to, to what's going on, right? Um, there is this thing, and I need to do a little bit more reading into it, but the whole believability scale, uh, I mean, that's one topic, right? It's so easy for people whether it's loved ones or friends or coworkers to not necessarily believe the chronic pain warrior and their pain experience. That's one thing. But on the other side, how do you believe people can start showing up uh, for our chronic pain warriors? We'll start with them first. How can they show up in a conversation authentically? Yeah. Yeah. That man. So there's a lot to unpack in there and I'll, and I'll just kind of hit on a few pieces. Sure. One, when you, when you spoke about, um, so as a, an individual with endometriosis that used to have it, used to really go through it, mm -hmm. um, the believability piece mm -hmm. is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things, especially for people of color, women of color, um, specifically, our research shows that when it comes to the pain that we're experiencing, our discomfort, it's mm -hmm. oftentimes minimized. Yes. Um, and so when uh, women of color are going in to talk to others, especially in the medical field, and we're saying, these are my symptoms, this is what I'm dealing with, mm -hmm. um, you're not supported, right? So that that adds to it. That adds, the, you know, the stress and the frustration adds to the pain. Absolutely. Um, and so that's one piece of it. And then when you're in this uh, relationship mm -hmm. and you are wanting to share with your loved one, like, I want you to get a small, if you could only get a small inkling of understanding of what I'm going through, mm -hmm. it would make such a big uh, impact on how you reacted and responded to me, to my needs. Right. And in turn, it would really shift things for me. So I'll just use myself uh, as, as, as an example. Mm -hmm. When I was in pain, um, I was tired of being in pain and I was tired of trying to make people understand right. the level of pain that I was in. Mm -hmm. And at times I didn't have the languaging to explain to you the type of pain that I'm in, mm -hmm. right? Um, I can recall one time, and this goes back to earlier, the experience that we have when we're in pain, especially women of color. I was in so much pain. I couldn't speak. No. Physically, literally, I yeah. could not. And so sometimes it's hard for others on the outside to understand that. Right now I'm in pain. I'm not ignoring you, but I cannot, yes. I'm, I don't have the emotional bandwidth right now. Right. And I don't have the physical capacity right now yes. to, to respond. That's all right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And it was so, I was at the emergency room in pain where you would think people would understand. Okay. Yeah. There must be a reason why <laughs> she's doubled over and not responding to us. Right. Instead, I will never forget it. The lady took a pin and poked me with it. And she said, if you don't respond to us, we're going to have to, um, I think she was asked, she was asking me something. Um, and I couldn't open my mouth to speak. And she poked me with a, with a pin. Um, oh my gosh. And yeah. Yeah. Like just unkind, uncaring. Mm -hmm. Um, but those, so when you're talking about being able to, um, communicate, Mm -hmm. and showing up 
in those moments and believability. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that belief that others believe you, mm-hmm. um, but then also the belief that today can be a better day for me. Right. Today I can believe, um, and this is really getting to the place of shifting your yeah. mindset, shifting your thinking. Exactly. And there really is a, is a connection between what you think, how you feel, and how you behave. And I always teach that connection first because I think that's important. Yes. So if you can tell yourself, okay, today, today can be better. I don't have to assume mm-hmm. that today I'm going to be in a million's worth of pain. I don't have to assume that. Right. I can right. expect, I can hope that today is better. And then if I'm disappointed, okay. But I, I don't have to come out of the gate believing that today is going to be a pain-filled day. Right. That is so important because um, what we think mm-hmm. plays such a huge role in how we feel. And more than 90% of us and 90% of the time, mm-hmm. we are behaving from our emotions and our feelings, exactly. right? We make yeah, we're behaving, we're, yeah. we're making choices and decisions from how we feel. Right. Well, our life is the culmination of our life. If we sit and think about where we are right now, yeah. it is one plus one plus one of decisions and choices and, and reactions and responses we've had. That's well, right. Well, honey, when we see the connection, then we recognize the importance of, wow, if I'm doing things from my feelings and my feelings come from my thinking, oh, I got to, I need to, to get up here. Exactly. Uh, Beautiful. Do you explain the pain pathways beautifully? Like it is the pain pathways um, are not just one center in the brain, right? They are multiple and they, they tap into, like you said, the emotions, the emotions, the feeling part of pain is such a protective mechanism, uh, and the most powerful, uh, of behavioral changers, so to speak. I don't know if that's an official word changers, but it is one of the most influential, um, for behaviors. And like you said, with behaviors for our listeners, once we practice those behaviors over and over, right, we get really good at them like riding a bike or walking, learning to walk. But unfortunately, the pain behaviors, like you're touching on so perfectly, the pain behaviors are really what start to hold us back and then start to amplify pain. So thank you for bringing that up. We talked a little bit about the believability, which is key. And I loved your reframe of taking that believability piece and making it into a slightly more positive narrative. Like, how can you put that into your court, that power into your court and make that more of a, a tool in your toolbox <laughs> as opposed to something that's going to amplify your pain? Talked a little bit about how the um, chronic pain warrior can kind of show up with that authenticity in communication. Flipping it to the sort of the caregiver now or the loved one, when it comes to um, listening, to really hearing what their loved ones are saying, you know, what sort of advice would you suggest around being a good listener? Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) that is so key. Now I'll say this, it takes practice Mm -hmm. and it is easier said than done. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to being, a, a, when you're wanting to, because as a spouse, you want to, um, you want to be there Mm -hmm. for, for your loved one. Right. Um, And when we, when we sometimes don't have the necessary tools, um, it's hard to be there. It's hard to show up. It's hard to hold space for the pain warrior. Mm-hmm. So if we are able to start out recognizing that, okay, I have the, now this is what we call reframing. So it's shifting your thinking, right? Mm-hmm. So instead of saying, Lord, I got to take care of, or I have to, it's, yes. I get to connect with my loved one mm-hmm. and I get to learn more about their experience mm-hmm. and I get to learn more about how I can support them in the way that they need to be supported. Right. So starting there from that mindset, how we think, right? Mm-hmm. is going to create feelings of empathy, of support, of concern. And when we're feeling that way, then we can behave. So the behavior is the listening, would be the listening part, right? 
So when we go into this uh, conversation that we may have, right, with, with our loved one, we're coming from, we're, we're, we're already going into it with an open heart and open mind, which makes it a lot easier mm -hmm. to actively listen, uh, to reflectively listen, right? So we're listening to them not to uh, come back and rebut what they're saying and no, you're not in pain and no, no but instead yeah. we're listening yeah. to hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I teach my couples is how to actively listen how to reflect back what your, your spouse is saying, right? So um, I hear you say, what I think I'm hearing you say is this, right. right? So you're listening to what they're saying. And then when you get a little bit better at it, it takes practice, you can also hear their heart in there as well. Mm -hmm. So not just the words that I'm saying, mm -hmm. but the emotions connected to it, how I'm feeling, right? right? And so when you're able, um, when the partner has that information, a lot of times they feel more secure mm -hmm. and because a lot of times they don't know the partner hasn't, hasn't learned how to, to, to hear, to listen actively. Yes. So we don't know what to do. I just, I don't know. I'm coming from my own space, my own ideas and assumptions, but now I'm armed with what my, my pain war is saying to mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. and I'm asking the right questions too, right? So one of those questions is, what do you need from me? Mm -hmm. How can I support you, right. Right? right? And that part is important because a lot of times we give love, we give support the way we like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so yeah. It, it's important to hear, okay, how do they receive love? What's their love language? What right. do they want from me? Mm -hmm. And so if you know that it becomes a lot easier to give them what they need. Yes. Um, but it does start with that communication piece. Beautiful. And I, I know that there's always sort of that two sides of the coin. There's the, the messy mix of sometimes feeling like you need to fix things for them. Um, and then we slide into the whole, uh, approach of autonomy you know how do you know when to again this is a whole other discussion but how do we know when to allow our loved one who lives with chronic pain that autonomy to be able to just forge ahead on their own confidently right yeah. and also I think that the other thing that I wanted to just bring back up again that you mentioned was uh, and you've said it twice and thank you for saying it is the whole safety and security thing right when it comes to chronic pain context matters right and that security or that feeling of safety is just so important when it comes to mitigating pain and i think that's one thing that's taken for granted very much so in the chronic pain community even the medical community about yeah. uh, but you know in your professional life you probably are stating that word over and over again with your clients right because the more safety the brain feels the less hopefully less pain it's going to, um, to experience as well. So by bringing that communication together, by being a good listener, by asking the right questions, uh, by being present, uh, maybe allowing for a little autonomy as well is just allowing for a little bit more of that security or that safety. So thank you for bringing that up. But I have some questions. I had so many questions rolling in my head last night. I couldn't sleep. So I had to put them on paper, but um, talking about safety. Mm -hmm. So with chronic pain, as you know, all too well, the word sensitization, right, where the, the hypervigilant state of our nervous system is absolutely a thing, it will amplify pain. And unfortunately, when conversations get to perhaps be a little more heated, that pain will go up. But how do we recommend or how do we really coach people through uh, keeping their emotions in check? when um, conversations get a little heated. Yeah, so that is, that's important. This goes back to uh, having that understanding that my feelings, my emotions are going to come from what I'm thinking. And so if I can get myself together, if I can get my thinking together um, first, so there's a couple of things that I teach my clients. Um, one, I teach them some, some calming techniques that they can use. So breathing, right? Because 
when we are in a space where we're uncomfortable, we're in pain, um, and, and we're in that fight or flight kind of uh, mindset, the rational part of our brain get that goes out of mm-hmm. that closes down. We're just reptilian, yes. uh, you know, so yes. it's in order to kind of close that part off and open up the part of the brain that is going to allow us to be a rational adult uh, and, and make to hear and listen. Yeah. Um, sometimes we have to do pre-work. And so I want to say this, that conflict is a natural part of any relationship, mm-hmm. right? Um, and conflict is an opportunity for growth. Mm-hmm. So if we know, hey, we're going to have to have a conversation, then there's pre-work that should be done. One, if you know you get anxious, worked up or whatever, then um, preparing yourself, challenging some of the thoughts that are coming up in your mind, right? If we know that I typically tend to um, jump to the conclusion, assume the worst. So there are some things called cognitive distortions. These are the thinkings, right? So if your uh, go-to Stinking thinking is uh, reading the mind of someone else, right? You're assuming that they are, are, are having the worst intention or you're jumping to the, the conclusion that, you know, this is going to be like it was the last time, mm-hmm. then that's going to that's gonna impact how you feel. And so if you can kind of go into this conversation already saying, hey, this is going to be I'm expecting, I believe, right? The believability. So I believe that this is going to be a really good conversation. Let's start there, right? And then start making, um, being mindful. How am I feeling? I always have my clients to start monitoring their body. Mm -hmm. How am I feeling right now? Am I starting to get agitated? Mm -hmm. Okay, Mm -hmm. let me do a little bit of breathing. And this is where communication comes in, where you say, hey, um, can I just take a little breathe the right, right quick. Just give me a second. Yeah. So I feel myself getting, getting agitated and I want this to be a really good conversation. So let me just breathe. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Right. So doing some breathing, um, that always helps to, to get your emotions under control. And then that reflective listening where, where you're saying, Hey, okay, is this what you're saying? I think I hear you saying this. Is this right? Because right. They can say, no, that was not what I meant at all. Or yes, that is exactly what I meant. Right. And so then we can go from there. So there are a few things that, that I always like to, to teach my clients to do yeah. Yeah. so that they can yeah. maintain control of their emotions. Oh, when yeah. and yeah. control. My gosh, there's such that need for that sense of control. So you're right. Just by reiterating or asking the questions just puts Mm -hmm. that control a little bit more back into their court and we'll take whatever we can get. Right. (laughs) You brought up some really good point. Cognitive distortion. Loved it. It is such a part of the chronic pain experience in the sense that with these pain behaviors, like we touched on before, um, these thoughts, this negative bias that we have tend to become dominant and stronger. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that you're asking people to check back in and just ensure, you know, ask the questions, do I know this to be hundred percent true? You know, uh, it's almost that constant negotiation. Right. And then of course you also mentioned, and this is probably come up a couple of times in our conversation around just the whole mind reading part. We are not mind readers, but we are really good at it. Right. It's uh, right. It's that, Oh, my day is going to be awful because I can yes. feel the pain already. Or my husband or my partner or whomever is not going to understand what I'm, or we're not going to believe me. So mm-hmm. you reframed it beautifully, uh, putting that positive spin on it, that healthier spin on it to say, I believe that this is going to be a great conversation. So when it comes to, self-confidence chronic pain in itself just depletes your self-worth your self-identity you name it when we throw trauma in the mix it's just that much more so how can one work on work through the lack of self-confidence just in a sort of a i know we're just scratching the surface here but what would you recommend that's a really good question and a lot of the um women that i that i coach deal with that, where um, they lack the self-confidence, um, their esteem is, is down in the pits. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And then when you have the pain and um, you're not able to, uh, you know, the pain seems like it's overtaking you, Mm -hmm. it can just bring you even further down. Like, what? I can't even control this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or there's this sense that your body has betrayed you. Like, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things that, um, and this is kind of where the self-care comes in, is um, doing little things. And as you do them and see that you're able to do them, Mm -hmm. it really starts to build your confidence back up. Um, So when we're, one of the biggest pieces about self-care is, I'll put it to you like this. We have, uh, we get in relationships with others And we haven't connected with us. We haven't uh, worked on, strengthened, and enhanced the relationship that we have with ourselves. So when um, the perspective that I take on self-care is connecting with you first, the relationship that you have with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so when you're able to really reconnect with you Mm -hmm. and you start to listen to you, that builds confidence as well, because what you're saying to yourself is, oh, I, my voice does matter. Mm-hmm. I am important. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to start treating you like you are important. Like I'm, how are you feeling today? Mm-hmm. Right? How do, how do, what is going on with you? Like giving your own self the voice mm-hmm. um, really is a wonderful way. And it does a whole lot of things. One, it lets you know that you're important. So you're building your esteem, but then it begins to challenge these harmful core beliefs that we've had in the mm-hmm. past that we don't matter. Our voice doesn't matter that um, maybe this is all in my head. I'm making more out of it than it, than what it is, right? Depending on what we've been hearing. So we really start to pull up those weeds mm-hmm. uh, that uh, have been planted over time based on what we've experienced. It, when you also, another benefit of this connecting with you and engaging in, in self-care is um, it really begins to shift you and your experience. Mm-hmm. I always say that your outer world does not have to change your inner world. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is I can still be in a situation that's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And I may, uh, from the outset, have some pain and discomfort, Mm -hmm. but inwardly, my inner world, my peace, my emotions Mm -hmm. can be just as calm. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. And that only comes from getting to this place where you are connecting with you. um, And that self-care encompasses your emotional health your mental health, your spiritual health, when you are allowing yourself to um, reconnect and to, to, to get those things in line to make sure that they're healthy as possible, it really changes things. It really does. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that I eventually got to the place of being able to do, and this is, this was so empowering for me. When I started to connect with me, I started being more intentional about my experience. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I had just been going through life. Like I was in pain Mm -hmm. and it's just, oh, just what, you know, this is going to be my life. That's the, that's the mindset that I had. Oh yes. (laughs) Yeah. But I started to get more intentional and more mindful of, okay, I am in pain. When does, when do I notice this pain? Mm -hmm. Right. I started to recognize that there were nuances to the pain. Mm -hmm. Um, I started to recognize that there were times when the pain dissipated or got more. So what? And the thing that empowered me, I eventually learned that I could control the pain. Mic drop right there. <laughs> Honestly, that is exactly my mission with pain to possibilities is reframing 
and re uh, learning how to observe your pain differently. And thank you. My gosh, if I could kiss you from here, I would. <laughs> One thing I wanted to just go back onto is when you were talking about, um, you know, that doing the deeper dive, and that is where a lot of the work comes from, right? We focus so much when it comes to chronic pain on the biological, the doctor's appointments, the procedures, the imaging, the medications, which has its place. But nowhere in what you just stated earlier did you at all touch on the biological. You did all the deep work, right? When you did um, the, the the spiritual, the psychological, the emotional health, your your surroundings, you know, I'm guessing you didn't go back to that ER after they pricked you with a pin because they were not supporting you, right? Never Mm -hmm. again. And so you did the deep work and you didn't necessarily have to tap into the biological. You did, but that was not Mm -hmm. the only piece, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. The other thing I love that you mentioned was that step-by-step process to really almost, it's just like my kids have gone through with therapy for anxiety. (laughs) You know, it's that gradual exposure which then builds that self-efficacy or that belief in themselves. So thank you for bringing that up with the ultimate goal, which that's why I'm so excited to have you here because I know you are there is you observed your pain differently. Well done. And thank you for bringing that up. I think what really I would love to maybe just touch on next is um, I spend a lot of time in these chronic pain support groups, which There is this real sense that if they were in a toxic relationship or if they're really in an unhealthy place and it really is uh, um, impacting their health and well-being and pain, when do you know, when is it the time to perhaps consider moving on from that relationship? Yeah, that is a really good question. And for women who are in, who are the the pain warriors and are in these relationships, Mm -hmm. um, it can be really challenging for us, especially if you have children, Mm -hmm. um, because we are nurturers, we, uh, this sense of family is important. Mm -hmm. We want our children to have, uh, you know, the best of both both worlds, right? A mom and a dad and, and have that, you know, intact unit. Mm -hmm. but if it's not healthy um, and there's a couple of ways that you can recognize whether or not this is a, this is a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, How is it impacting you? Is it draining? So if, if emotionally you are just depleted whenever you are around this person, um, if this person is unable to support you, right? Emotionally, if you are always being brought down, um, there's this uh, resources. It's the power and control wheel. You can Google it and, and see it. It's got some really good information as far as um, the power differentials, right? Mm-hmm. If there is emotional abuse, right? So it doesn't have to always be physical abuse, right? But if the person is always name calling, not supporting you, yeah. um, and is manipulative, is controlling you. Right. Um, it's a toxic relationship. And so when we uh, think about, oh, I want my family intact and I think it's best for them to, to, to see a mom, uh, you know, two parent household, mm-hmm. research shows that if what they're seeing in this two parent household is horrible, it's having a horrible effect and it's actually healthier for you to move and for them to be in that single parent household that is a healthier non-toxic uh, environment. So um, challenging your thinking, right? Because if we feel guilty, if we feel torn, then more than likely we're not going to, to leave, mm-hmm. right? And so it's going back to the beginning, our thinking. Right. So reminding yourself that I deserve, right? And this is the use of affirmations, which I, I teach as well. So I deserve to be in a healthy relationship because if I'm not, my body is telling the tale and I cannot be of any assistance to anybody else if I'm broken down, Mm -hmm. but really um, getting past that guilt. I think that's what holds a lot of people in relationships a lot longer uh, than they, than they should. And I was, I was there, I was there. I, I wanted my daughter to see 
uh, you know, a mother and a father, a healthy, especially in the black community. Like I wanted her to see a healthy black family. But honey, no, not when, no, this is the, right. mm -mm, yeah, time to go. good for you. Good for you. And I, I should say also that it, it's interesting because it's easy for us as humans also in Facebook to, you know, cheering on these people to say, no, you leave him, leave him. Depending on the situation, of course, there may be space for a little bit of the work to happen. If they are feeling like there is that space and that energy yeah. <laughs> to be able yeah. to, the capacity to be able to, you know, work through things, but absolutely beyond that, if not, you're right, then yeah. it's probably healthier <laughs> yeah. if they are able to. It makes me sad when there are financial constraints and if they're holding on because they believe, you know, yes. the better solution when, you know, really it may not be. So anyway, thank you. I know that was one thing that um, we could talk for hours about, but I think it's important to at least mention. Anything else I may have missed, Rachel, that you wanted to sort of touch on before we wrap things up? This is good. This was really good. And I'm so glad that your listeners um, are able to get, you know, your heart in this to help um, individuals that are dealing with chronic pain learn the possibilities that there is life past pain mm -hmm. and pain doesn't have to run your life. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're, you know, I love this and I'm so happy to, to be a part of in this conversation and just, I would encourage the pain warrior um, to look at sometimes when we're used to something, um, it becomes our companion a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I want to challenge them to get uncomfortable mm -hmm. with being in pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to be comfortable with it. Like this is my lot in life. Doesn't have to necessarily be. Right. Um, and so I want, I want to encourage that. The other thing is um, just the self-care, connecting, make a commitment to connecting with you, like learning you all over and learning um, through this, how you can grow. Mm -hmm. What is, what is the, what is the good that comes from this? I know that sounds so weird, but in anything that we go through, there is always glass half full, glass half empty. We get to choose how we look at it. But how is this helping you and your loved one mm -hmm. um, grow and strengthen the relationship? Right. So I want to just oh, share that. Wraps it up beautifully. If really believe that if there is a slight capacity, if there's a little inkling to change that relationship with pain, to start doing the deep work, because it is work, like you said, and it takes time and patience and gentle guidance. Mm -hmm. I want to say thank you so much for your time. Uh, I cannot, I, I knew we would uh, hit it off as far as having much to talk about. Yeah. I could continue this conversation for so much longer, but I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to also maybe ask if someone wants to reach out to you, uh, mm -hmm. where could they find you? Sure. I am on just about all social media platforms at RDH Counseling and Consulting LLC. Um, so you can find me on Facebook. Uh, you can, uh, my website is uh, info. No, my email is info at rdhcounseling.com. And the website is www.rdhcounseling.com. So you can find me on all of the platforms that way. Perfect. I will be sure to add a link to the podcast as well. So people can reach out if they need to. Thank you again. This has been an absolute pleasure. I hope uh, this serves our listeners well as I know it will. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.